Hi everyone. Thanks for joining us for our first live chat on Periscope. I'm Inga Mewburn, running the Survive PhD 15 hash Twitter track tonight. You can see behind me the hashtag on the board there. And I have my moderators here and they're around the corner. You can't see them right now. Um, and they're there to answer any questions or you can ask them questions. And they're going to tweet out links as I talk tonight. So first of all, uh, we'd like to thank you all for participating on the forum so amazingly to, um, over this last week. We had over 2,000 people join us in the first week of the MOOC. So we're now at over 9,500 PhD students, supervisors. I notice there's friends, there's grandmas, there's mothers, there's fathers. It's amazing. And we want to thank you all for the really, really kind and supportive behaviour that we've seen on the MOOC. You know, it's just so many posts, we can't get around to everyone. Sometimes we see people in trouble, um, people experiencing terrible things. And what we also see is people talking to those people, sharing their experiences and um, just sharing the love around. So we're, we're amazed and um, so much gratitude and love for you all. So thank you very much. Um, thanks to everyone for jumping in on threads. You don't have to start a new thread. You can talk to other people um, and there's no kind of uh, limit on how many posts you can make or anything. So go ahead. Um, I would also noticed on Twitter that the hashtag trended the first week, the first day of the week that we started tweeting, and the Survive PhD hashtag has been going strong ever since. Uh, we've been using Storify to capture some of that for those of you who aren't on Twitter, and we have also uh, put some of those Storify up online. But if you like Storify and you want to make some of your own, please do and share and use the hashtag so we can see it. Remember that you can just watch the social media tab inside the MOOC if you want to watch what's going on in Twitter and Instagram. And we'd like to recognise uh, Julian. Julian's uh, Twitter name is at... OzJulianCox. At, at OzJulianCox. Thank you, Julian. You have a badge for outstanding contributor. And we'd like to also thank Floss and Floss's hashtag... Uh, She's not on Twitter. It's Floss56. Floss56 and Floss56... Um, has also got a badge for outstanding contributor um, in the in the uh, forums. Um, Floss, we gave you an outstanding contributor for starting a Facebook group for older students. And you can join that. That's facebook.com forward slash PhD owls, O-W-L-S, which is all one word. So if you're over the age, did she give an age, Katie? I have no idea. If you're of an age, <laughs> a certain age, and you feel like you're an oldie, then there's plenty of other people to talk to. I see I'm getting some love hearts for that, so there may be some of you out there right now. Also special mentions to other people that we noticed um, talking on the forums and starting conversations that seem to have a lot, of, uh, a lot of followers. So Amy O'Shea, who I believe is my friend from Melbourne, Burn 9 Sue McIntyre, Stephen Cook 56, Kirsty BUK, Fing, Fing Hing, and Doi Leg. Thank you so much. Um, they're great conversation starters. There's been many, many amazing posts from other people who've chosen to re remain anonymous because they're talking about sensitive, difficult topics, and that's totally fine, but we can't recognise you, obviously, by name, but thank you for that. And we'll be getting in touch with those people to tell them how they can pick up their digital badge, which you should be able to display in places like Facebook. Um, so me and the team have done the best we can to respond to the post, but there's thousands and thousands of them, and we really appreciate when you jump in and offer support. Sometimes we go and we visit posts and we decide we've got nothing further to say because um, everyone's already responded and shared with each other, which is great. Uh, so please get that up. Don't forget that you can vote on posts, and if you vote on a post, you're likely to give, drive that person up on the leaderboard to get a badge. So if you think someone's posting interesting things, starting great conversations, or just being really brave, um, give them a vote. We noticed also um, that some people were sharing really heartfelt stories, sometimes of terrible things that happened and amazing resilience. Um, and uh, we were search found ourselves searching through the forums to find words like depressed or sad because we wanted to find those people and offer them a helping hand. If you see someone who's posted something and no one's responded and they look sad and lonely, you can flag it um, or report it and uh, let the moderators know that someone needs a helping hand and talk to them yourself. So it'd be really great if you could keep helping us out like that. The structure of the discussion boards in edX is fairly strange 
and it makes it difficult for us sometimes to find things. Now, if you find the conversations just way too full on for you, and of course you couldn't just sit there and read all the posts, you wouldn't do anything else, and we do want you to write your PhDs. So if you uh, do want to actually, um, uh, I've totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> what was I saying, team? We were on Twitter, so we didn't hear. Okay, <laughs> they were way too busy. Um, so if you find it all just a bit overwhelming, try searching up on the discussion boards for keywords, maybe your topic area, your area of interest, maybe you're into anthropology, maybe you're into history. Just type that into the discussion boards um, and then you'll find hopefully people who are, are, are sharing similar things or working in similar areas. Now, if you'll recall, there was a forum that we added which asked people for uh, questions for the live chat. Now you could vote on those questions um, and send them further up and they're the questions that I pick up in this broadcast in the evenings every Tuesday or evening. Now the ones that actually got the most traffic and seemed to be of the most interest were questions about motivation, procrastination and imposter syndrome. And a lot of that we'll actually be tackling the week after next. So I'm not going to pick up those questions right now. I'm going to come back to them because it'd be really great to have discussions about imposter syndrome and things like that. Once we know exactly what it is and we can talk more knowledgeably and ask, ask more detailed questions. So we will come back to that. I'm not ignoring it. I'm just going to tackle the other questions that I think are quite relevant to just the start off the MOOC, general overviews of emotions and so on. Okay, so first of all, Katerina Maruzzi asks, how can we make the people who are around us and who have not experienced a PhD understand emotionally what we're going through? And similarly, Kat McKeegan asked, how do you navigate committee dynamics and stay positive to what feels like an uphill battle? What about family and friend dynamics? Support circles are important, but sometimes it seems like everyone just wants to know what, how it's going or has an idea to contribute. Often, after a long stressful day or week of thesis work, the last thing I want to do is talk to someone further on my research, particularly if that discussion leads itself to me arguing my thesis statement, and I can certainly relate to that feeling. Sometimes people's interests, um, although well meant, can be a little bit oppressive. Now, of course, how do you deal with this? Well, one thing is you can encourage them to do the course with you. At the end of the 10 weeks, they should have maybe a more intellectual understanding of what you're going through. And it's not too late to join in. And as you've seen, the course material is very light. Uh, you should be able to get through the reading in less than an hour and watch whatever video, follow up some links. So it's not a big ask of someone in terms of time. But there are some other resources. I'm going to ask my moderators now to tweet out some of these books. There's two books in particular that you might find interesting to hand to a relative. The first one is Thesis Survivor Stories, and these are accounts of doing a thesis. Um, it's written up in a nice volume, and that's by AUT. And the other one is The Unruly PhD, which is, uh, I guess, along similar lines, um, extracting information from people's stories and, um, and writing accounts of what people are going through during the PhD. So there's some sort of understandings of the PhD process. So at least your family can see you're not going crazy. You're not alone. These, these feelings and issues are quite common. Now, some people get into genuine conflict with their family members. And I've had a lot of success with some students um, with books like, and it sounds a little bit dorky, but The Dance of Anger, uh, a good old classic, um, is good for breaking through um, unhelpful relationships where you've got into a way of talking that just isn't working for you anymore. Now, the book's explicitly aimed at women, but I don't think that... Um, I don't think that they should be the only ones reading it. I think it's very useful. And it has some con um, concepts in it that are, are helpful. And it has some suggestions for how to move conversations and to start um, using different language and ways that you might be able to break through some of those sort of, um, you know, repeated arguments if you find yourself over and over the same um, territory. Now, finally, I think if they've not done a PhD themselves, perhaps they really can't understand and, um, but what you can do that perhaps is teach them how to better respond and react to the stresses. Um, and I think one thing that family members do well meaningly is to offer a similar experience or um, offer a suggestion or offer help that's not really help. Um, and um, these are kind of unwelcome remedies, if you like, and they can almost get annoying. So I can certainly relate to that. Um, and I have a post back in the day that I wrote called Five Ways to Soothe an Anxious PhD Student. 
my moderators will be tweeting out that post now. And basically what that was is uh, stock phrases that you can teach your family members to say to you and reasons why these phrases work. And the top phrases, and I'll tell you briefly why they do work, is uh, what can I, instead of saying, here's what you should do, the family member could say, what can I do to help? So it might be that you want a foot massage. It might be that you want them to cook dinner. It might be that you want to go for a walk. It might be that you want them to go away. Um, and so by asking, how can I help, rather than you should do this, they give you the power of choice over what you want to happen next. The next thing they could possibly say to you is something soothing like, this too shall pass. Um, and just to be with you and not try and diagnose or change the conversation away, just to, to let it pass through. They might also ask you, um, what did you do last time you had a similar problem? And again, that prompts you to think about your own coping strategies and how you might, um, you might activate some things that you've learnt in the past. And sometimes it's having a sounding board, having someone listen to you talk of those things through can be amazingly helpful. Um, another one that I think is a really great thing to say to a family member is, I'm going to leave you alone for a while so you can work, but I'll be back later and we can do something nice together. And that's respectful. It's showing you need the time. Obviously, you need to just get through this stress on your own, but I'm not leaving you alone. I'm not abandoning you. Um, I am going to come back. And I think that can move things in a helpful direction. And finally, and I think this is so crucially important and supervisors take note, it's simply to say that this thesis is going to be so interesting. It's going to be so important. It's going to be so worthwhile. I believe in you. I believe you can do this. And um, that can get oppressive if over-applied, but I think sometimes we all need to hear that. Okay, so hopefully there's some tips there. Uh, second question came through from Woody895, and it says, I'm a PhD student currently in my second year, and I've noticed a trend in non-student colleagues most who have completed a PhD, to dis dismiss suggestions of being stressed or struggling with long work hours as part of the PhD, rather than offering suggestions on how to manage time more efficiently or offer support. Do you have any suggestions about how to approach this? Especially considering as research positions are becoming more competitive, the culture seems to be to work longer and longer hours. A good one to discuss, I think. A culture of ignoring emotional well-being and valuing martyrs. And wow, when I read that, I thought, so true. And the next thing I thought was guilty as charged um, for overworking. And if I could change anything about academia, it would be this, this cult of overwork and the superstar mentality. Sometimes when we're asked to put panels together to talk to PhD students, it's always like find the person who's so amazing and we set up these role models that you know it's great we can aspire to that but not all of us can or wants to um, put in the hours and the work that's necessary to make that happen. Um, so of course drawing your boundaries and pushing back against unreasonable expectations is really important but how to do it because sometimes you push, make the pushback and the person says well I'm working really hard and um, later in the course, we'll talk about how trauma has become kind of a badge of honour of the PhD, that somehow if you're not suffering, uh, you're not working hard enough. And I don't think that's necessarily true. And I think the thing that we really need when it comes to changing this culture of overwork um, is good leadership. And we need people talking about this and offering insights. And I think the key person that I follow, who I, I really deeply admire and respect, is Kate Bowles. And her blog is called Music for Deck Chairs. And Kate's an incredible, um, insightful critic of workplace culture. Um, and she help, or sometimes offers really helpful strategies, but just the insights are really amazing. And a good example of her work recently is Service as Service. Kate herself suffered cancer. And um, the reason that she didn't get diagnosed soon enough was that she was working too hard and she put off that self-care that's so crucial. And I must say, every time that I feel myself putting off that health check, putting off going to the doctor, feeling that stress. I think of Kate and I think um, we need more people like Kate who are who are speaking the truth about some of these um, ill effects of overwork. So uh, Music for Deck Chairs and my team should have tweeted out uh, the link to the blog. And my final question here is another great one from Japasco, J-A-P-A-S-C-O-E. On emotion from a supervisor's perspective, this was a really interesting uh, comment. Emotional issues are very important, uh, very personal, says Japasco. 
I would find it difficult to ask a student about them if they didn't volunteer anything themselves, even if I suspect there's something troubling them. How do I create an atmosphere or setting where talking about emotions can happen? And this is a really important question. It's actually, again, really difficult to answer, which is what's so great and what I'm enjoying so much about this MOOC is, is the kind of insights and questions people are asking. Because, of course, I could blog for years after this, and that's always a happy, happy place for me. So it is difficult to answer. Um, striking a balance is difficult. Students and other staff members want their personal space. They don't want to necessarily have to go to work and talk about every problem. And most supervisors, in fact, probably the overwhelming majority, are not trained counsellors and should not at all be taking on that role. But, I mean, aside from the fact that it, it turns it into perhaps an unhealthy dependency relationship, it also is something you're not trained to do and um, you may do more harm than good. There are, however, a few practical things that I think a supervisor can do that cre creates more open space um, for these issues to be talked about. And the first thing I think is just to talk about your own emotions more. So we've all been bored, frustrated, afraid, and various other emotions that we'll talk about in the MOOC about the research experience. And I think if more supervisors were prepared to share some of that, um, instead of creating this sort of perfect role model of perfect competence and unruffled calm, you're creating a role model that's realistic, that, you know, you show some of your flaws um, and you normalise this for a research student so they don't think when they have these feelings that they're weird or that somehow they signal that they're not good enough. And I think by normalising these struggles and helping students see them as something we all experience and we all overcome on a daily basis is healthy. And I think one of the things, ways that we can share our emotions is through telling stories. So stories of times we've struggled or other people have studied, struggled, encourage storytelling in groups. Stories are surprisingly a um, great way of um, sharing strategies and tactics and things that people can adopt and use for their own purpose. And of course, I do this on the blog a lot. And you'll notice that every second week there'll be a post, which is often a story from someone, because I really believe in the power of stories as ways of, of learning and learning about, you know, terribly difficult strategic kind of action. Now, finally, there is definitely a class of supervisor who's just not interested in the topic that the student is pursuing. Unfortunately, um, we have a very aged workforce in Australia. 50% of our academics are over the age of 50. It's actually not uncommon for people to have supervisors who die um, or leave, and then they are assigned to another supervisor who was never that interested in the topic in the first place. Sometimes the load in the department is quite high, and it means that um, people get students that they would not normally be given. And so it's actually terribly difficult for them to bring enthusiasm or genuine interest into the topic. And I would never for a second suggest that those people just ignore or pretend that they are interested in the research. You can, however, I think, demonstrate that although you might not be that interested in research itself, you do care about the student and you care about their well-being. And you make sure that you tell them that you know, I might not be super interested in what you're doing, but I'm super interested in you getting a PhD. How can I help you with that? How can I help you get in contact with and start communicating with the network of people around the world who would be interested in the topic and to, to actively help the student make connections um, and be interested in at least their well-being and their um, welfare? OK, so that's the end of the questions that I've got um, on the MOOC that I wanted to address. I want to thank Katie, who's sitting over there, um, for preparing a great Storify in response to questions about exercise and health. And um, I must say, I was very good at exercising during my PhD, but I was no, no good at it afterwards. And I see that there are a lot of people on Periscope are suggesting uh, great things like bushwalking and swimming and yoga and things that can be really helpful to help us stay sane. So we've got 10 minutes left on the broadcast and I don't know Katie, Jonathan and Anna. I'm going to slightly rotate at risk of creating heaps of noise. So you can see I'm watching the cord at the bottom. There's other people here. See them all? Give them some love. They can only see my hand. They can oh. only see her hand. Okay, there's love hearts. See, look all the love hearts. Thank Hello, you. Guys. <laughs> Thank you, my amazing team of moderators. And are you going to tell me any questions that have come through, comments on Twitter that you want to pick up? 
Yeah, we had a good one, which was, is it realistic to expect emotionally involved supervisors? Is it realistic? Um, I think the, the term emotionally involved can happen on many, many levels. I think it's realistic to expect a supervisor that really cares about a student getting a PhD. And I think it's realistic to expect a supervisor um, cares if a student is experiencing health problems or emotional problems to the point they want to help. Um, so I think that is realistic, but you know, um, everyone's got their own emotional style. And um, you know, some, some cultures, for instance, tend towards being more demonstrative than others. And I think that often it's, it's between the two people what they're actually comfortable with together. Um, and that's something you need to work out. I suppose what I'm trying to emphasise here is to, to be a little more open to it um, rather than just never talk about it. And that's why we made the PhD, this, uh, this MOOC about emotions because we think it isn't talked about enough. Is that a good enough answer? I think that's a great answer. Oh, thank you, Katie. <laughs> Katie thinks it's a great answer. Any more questions there? We're just waiting for questions to come in. Okay. So. We've got a little bit of a delay. On that. And we had a very lovely meeting tonight for the first Canberra meetup. How many people were there, do you think? About 30? 30, 30, yeah. Yeah, 30 people, which was great. So we'll organise another one halfway through the MOOC for Canberra region. So please do turn up. Notice on the Join the Discussion um, discussion Board that there's meetups in London. Um, I know there's some being organised in Edinburgh, um, in Glasgow, um, and of course there's many Facebook um, groups forming online, which is fantastic. Any more questions from Twitter yet? Um, Maria just said um, she feels a lot of supervisor guilt. I've been so hectic, I feel like a poor role model for my students. Mm, supervisor guilt. Now, there's a good blog post. There's definitely a blog post in that. Um, so, um, feeling like a bad supervisor because you've been too busy yourself. I mean, I constantly feel like a bad supervisor. I think often, um, and yet my students tell me I'm not, um, and I think often we can feel like a bad supervisor because we put a lot of pressure on ourselves as academics. We often um, per have perfectionistic tendencies. We're used to working with a lot of detail. Um, we're thorough. We like to finish things. And um, I think that this can translate into lots of areas of work. So I would say probably if you're feeling guilty, you're probably the person who shouldn't be feeling guilty because at least... Uh, at least you're caring. It's the ones that sort of don't even seem to notice the effect they're having on other people that I worry about the most. And maybe just think about your own self-care, you know, um, and your own workload and see if there's anything you can do with that. Have a, have a read of Kate's blog. I think it, it talks very ably and well about the pressures that you get from email and um, the feeling like you want to help other people all the time and drawing boundaries is really difficult. Um, but I think the feeling guilty is probably a good sign that you are the caring type. Hmm. Any other questions from yeah. Twitter? So there was one kind of person commenting on how much about my emotions should I disclose to my supervisors? What's the line between sharing too much and not enough? Mm, oversharing and not sharing enough. Um, yeah, see, I think oversharing can be just as bad because sometimes you're shifting the emotional burden onto the other person. And I think um, you might not be shifting on to the person that you really need to be talking to. So I think, and I know a lot of students feel really uncomfortable about going to counselling services at their university, but honestly, uh, you shouldn't see this as a weakness or somehow that you're crazy. Uh, these people see hundreds and hundreds of students and what they're talking about constantly are things like overwork and emotion. And I think the, the thing, thing that a counsellor can do for you is that they can give you another perspective and um, show you language for talking about your emotions. And they can perhaps advise you if you're feeling uncomfortable on, on how to approach having these conversations because they can be difficult. Um, and I think... Um, uh, so, so the first step I would say is that, you know, if you feel uncomfortable about it, talk to a professional um, and learn some, some strategies for discussing these things. Um, I have various different sorts of relationships with different students. I suppose I invite that emotional connection with people, but I have had students that really haven't needed that from me and I haven't necessarily offered it. And sometimes I wonder whether they did need it and I didn't offer it. Um, and this, is, this just goes to show what a complex relationship the student-supervisor sort of uh, dynamic can be. Um, but the one thing I will say is that, that no one person is responsible for your PhD success or failure. 
but it does take a village and that supervisor is a very important person in your village but they aren't the only one so networking going to peer events talking with your peers um, attending um, social events that are put on at the uni they're there for a purpose um, to give us all an outlet for talking about these kind of things so we don't overburden anyone do you have time for one or two more i do yeah so one of them which i think you'll like is why isn't there accreditation for supervisors when it's really important oh <laughs> <laughs> why is there not accreditation for supervisors there is in some universities the university I was at before ANU, RMIT, it had a research active criteria. And so it was measured on how many papers you wrote, how many grants you got, how many throughput you had of students. And it was not measured on quality. Um, so there are other systems, I believe, where they do take quality into account. Many places have compulsory training and they have registers and the training has to be completed maybe yearly. We don't have that at ANU, it's quite controversial. Um, so every university is very different in the way that they approach the professionalisation of their supervisors. My point of view is that um, supervisor training is incredibly important and we need to provide it for people. But I think we also need to recognise that there's many levels of competence. And I think um, making a one size fits all program for people and forcing everyone to do the same thing is not very respectful. I feel like that about PhD students too, and I feel like that about supervisors. So I think we need to have a suite of resources available. And part of the reason that we do this MOOC, um, which originally started out just being for supervisors, is to provide some of that professional training in, in an easy to access and fun sort of way. Yes, another question? There, yeah, there's a few more. We've got um, uh, what to do if your supervisor doesn't seem invested in your research or your future. Okay, if your supervisor doesn't seem invested in your research or your future, I think you have two options. One is uh, kick them to the curb. <laughs> Just break the relationship up, find someone who does. That's one option, and it's not always a realistic or good option for people. The other option is um, learn to do and find that for yourself. Invest in finding those discussion groups, those friends, those international network of peers that can give you the support and invest in your, your future and your future as a researcher um, if your supervisor doesn't really connect with you or doesn't seem really interested. Um, and I think they're the only two options you've really got. Um, and uh, many, many people are afraid of leaving their supervisor or changing their supervisor, often more afraid than they should be. Sometimes uh, the supervisor has been waiting for the person to initiate the conversation. Sometimes it's terrible. Sometimes it's like a divorce. In fact, often it's like a divorce. It's either kind of amicable and everyone just gets on with it or it's really terrible and we, there's ongoing fallout. So these are the kind of political difficulties that you can get into, I think. Um, and one of the books that I found really helpful in thinking through these kind of tricky political issues is Miss Mentor's impeccable advice to women and men in academia. And um, if one of my colleagues wants to see if they can find that on Google and post it, that would be really good. Yeah. Ms. Mentor, MS Mentor. Mm -hmm. What about I write it on the board? Look. Impeccable advice. Yes, Ms. Mentor's impeccable advice to women and men in ac academia. Got it. Okay, Katie's going to tweet it out. And that, um, she has some very sneaky tactics. Um, and cunning strategies and I've often given that book to people and some of the stories in that are pretty amazing but she has she has sort of a charm offensive way of getting through problems that I find particularly attractive of sort of fixing things without creating terribly difficult messy, messy relationship breakups in in the wake of it so um, worth having a look at Miss Mintor. Shall we take one more? One more question, sure. Um, so we had a question from Claire, which is, what is the best way to start a conversation about emotion with a supervisor you don't know very well? How do you start a conversation about emotion with a supervisor you don't know very well? Yeah, how do you? Any thoughts on that, team? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts on that on Twitter? Maybe someone wants to join in with some ideas about how you can start that conversation. Um, Some, carefully. <laughs> carefully, yeah, that's one answer. Um, maybe peak the emotion, you know, don't sort of go in with every emotion at once. Maybe there's one particular emotion. If it's something about how their feedback makes you feel, I think that that's, um, 
that's quite uh, a, a sort of a starting point for having those conversations. You know, you could say something like, I feel, um, when, when you say this on my feedback, uh, when you give, put, write this on my work, then I, it doesn't make me feel very empowered. Or, you know, um, there's assertive language. In fact, I've got my assertive language checklist here, which is quite helpful. And you'll notice that I have my assertive language checklist stuck on my wall as a great reminder of how to start start difficult conversations and the first step it has in here is describe so describe the situation that bothers you sticking closely to the facts and being specific last week you didn't show up for our meeting and i waited around an hour so describe next thing you do is express express your feelings about the situation using an i statement i felt angry with you for letting me down empathize empathize with the person's needs feeling or situation if this is appropriate so i realize you may have been busy and specify. Specify clearly the actions or outcomes you want of the other person. In future, I would like you to let me know if you are unable to keep our appointment. And consequences. Mention the anticipated positive consequences of this change. So that way I can plan my time accordingly and I'll be much more focused when we, when we meet. Now it sounds really formal and kind of weird and lame, but I find that just having the sheet on my wall with the steps, describe, express, empathise, specific in consequences is really useful and I think I can't emphasize enough the value of before you have a conversation with someone especially a really difficult one think about what do I want from this conversation what outcome do I want so if actually if you think about it and the outcome is that you want closure because you're angry it's likely you're not going to ever get closure so letting go of that and deciding instead what I want from this conversation is I want something specific to change in the way that we're communicating. That's maybe a more realistic goal than thinking that the person's going to back down and say, I'm terribly sorry, I'm the worst person in the world. Um, it's much easier to sort of aim for things that are realistic. We had a suggestion from Twitter, which was, I have always found the good old feedback sandwich works well. <laughs> the feedback sandwich. Well, sometimes, as we call it in the trade, the shit sandwich. So <laughs> <laughs> you have nice statement, not so nice statement, followed up by nice statement. So, um, so yes, sandwiching something terrible that you have to say between two good things is a pretty standard strategy. Um, but um, and, and I think it's just useful to employ anyway when you're giving feedback to anybody. It's a rule, of course. Yep. I think. I think we're done. I think we've come to time. And I think we've come to time. Yep. Yep. We've gone five minutes over time, actually. So um, thanks for joining us for our first Periscope chat. Thank you for all the love hearts. And thanks for sticking around, um, to all 331 of you. Um, I really yeah. appreciate you coming and watching, making the time to watch tonight. We'll make it available on the course and we'll see you same time next week. Thanks. See you soon.